Good afternoon and welcome to the Michael Your Show. This is part two featuring Dr. Arwen Smallwood from North Carolina A&T, um, actually North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University. Okay, Dr. Smallwood, could you briefly uh, reintroduce yourself and then um, we'll put your contact information in for the audience. Um, uh, again, I'm uh, Dr. Arwen Smallwood. I'm the chair of the Department of History and Political Science at North Carolina A&T State University. Um, I specialize in research on North Carolina history, particularly Eastern North Carolina history, uh, African American history, and I look at the relationship between African Americans and Native Americans um, in uh, Eastern North Carolina. I'm going to pick up where I left off, and this presentation still will deal with, um, you know, the triracial identity of Indians in North Carolina uh, uh, and southeastern Virginia. And I specifically look at Tuscaroras, Maharans, Nottaways, all of whom are Iroquois, but then also other Indian groups who are of Siouan uh, background or of um, Algonquin background. Um, so we're going to go ahead and pick up where we left off, and I'm going to move into uh, specifically talking about Eastern North Carolina. My earlier presentation kind of started broadly and talked about the relationship between the North Carolina Indians and the other Indians uh, east of the Mississippi. And then I moved into starting to talk about North Carolina Indians uh, in particular and the impact of the Spanish and the English uh, on uh, native peoples here in North Carolina and Virginia. So I'm going to pick up now and continue to talk about the development of native peoples and mixing between native peoples, Africans, and Europeans in uh, North Carolina and South, Southeastern Virginia, uh, and help, hopefully will help you better understand the uniqueness of Eastern North Carolina and the peoples here in the state of North Carolina. Uh, next slide, please. So we ended our last uh, conversation talking about various native groups, and I listed roughly 16 of them here that were in northeastern North Carolina and southeastern Virginia. Uh, the largest group in eastern North Carolina were the Tuscarora Indians, and they were, you know, a very influential group of Indians who traded and, of course, uh, were militaristic but controlled most of eastern North Carolina and much of southeastern Virginia uh, from pretty much uh, south of Richmond, Petersburg, uh, down to the Cape Fear. And the Maharans and the Nottaway Indians of Virginia, all of whom are Iroquois, and the Nottaways and Maharans are split off from the Tuscaroras. They're from the same basic genetic mix. Uh, we're all, you know, basically uh, in alliance together and traded together, intermarried with one another, and worked together. And then the other Indians of the eastern part of North Carolina, like the Machapunga, Bear River, Madame Mesquite, Choanokes, Yilpin. Um, many of the eastern Indians east of them in the coastal or tidewater area of uh, North Carolina and Outer Banks were uh, Algonquin people, Algonquin speaking people. Um, but many of them came into alliance with the Iroquois, particularly after the arrival of the Europeans and their push from the coast to the, uh, to the interior. Uh, many of these Indians ended up coming into alliance with the Tuscarora Indians. Next slide, please. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the English and the arrival of the first Africans. Um, and I call them Drake's Regiment. Uh, and there are roughly 700 Indians that uh, were uh, Africans that were involved with Sir Francis Drake. Uh, most people are familiar with the Lost Colony. If you ask about the Lost Colony of 1587, uh, most people know about the hundred and some whites who were left on Roanoke Island who disappeared, and it's been one of the great mysteries in American history and in North Carolina history uh, as to what happened to those people. But very few people know that a year prior to that, that Sir Francis Drake brought over seven, six, seven hundred Africans, a regiment is 700 roughly, uh, but somewhere between three and six hundred Africans whom he had employed uh, uh, to fight for England against the Spanish and had used to raid islands in the Spanish Caribbean and attack Spanish ships all through uh, Cuba, the Lesser Antilles, Florida, Fort St. Augustine's, and even in parts of South Carolina. And then as a reward for their service, brought them to and released them in um, Eastern uh, North Carolina on Roanoke Island. Uh, next slide, please. 
So when we talk about uh, the English in Eastern North Carolina, most people understand that the English, uh, Ralph Lane and John White explored and mapped Eastern North Carolina. This is a recreation of one of their early maps, which was shown in the first, in part one. Uh, so they knew a good deal about the native peoples in the coastal areas in Northeastern North Carolina, uh, in and around the Great Dismal Swamp area, and even to the south of the Albemarle Sound, uh, in and around the Alligator uh, Swamp. And so they made contact with native peoples, as I mentioned before, spread disease, which ended up ravaging native communities, uh, but they mapped villages and had some understanding of the native people. Uh, in rowing up the Roanoke River, this is a highlight of Bertie County, and to the south of Bertie County is the Roanoke River, and Ralph Lane and his expedition went up the Roanoke River. They were attacked by the Tuscarora Indians who lived in uh, the that part of Bertie County and in eastern North Carolina. Uh, they had no interest in allowing the English to explore and gather intelligence about their area and about their villages. And so they attacked them and drove them back out to Roanoke Island. Uh, this is well documented. We know that they fled to the island. They, we know they kind of prepared for another attack. But Drake arrives uh, you know, shortly after this, and he basically picks up the explorers and he releases these Africans, you know, on the island and in eastern North Carolina, and he sails back to England with these early explorers who had really agitated the local Indians as well as devastated the local Indian populations from their spread of disease. Next slide, please. This is a, a recreation of the attack on uh, Lane's expedition on the Roanoke River. Next slide, please. And these, uh, again, the Africans that were released on Roanoke Island, um, most of these Africans, as I said, between three and 600, regiment is 700, and he had created basically an African regiment. Um, most of these Africans were armed. They um, were given guns and they used their guns to fight for England. And so when these Africans were released on Roanoke Island, one of the things that we see happening is that these Africans have weapons, they have, you know, training, and they are prepared to exist in this hostile landscape. In fact, many of these Africans were maroons, what we call runaway slaves uh, throughout the Spanish Caribbean and throughout the Americas. And they had lived in very harsh conditions in swamps and in the mountainous areas of the Lesser Antilles and Greater Antilles and Florida. And so when they were introduced into eastern North Carolina with their weapons, they were actually given a tactical advantage over the native populations that were there. And then you have to also remember that those native populations had been decimated by diseases that were spread by the early explorers. As I mentioned in my previous presentation, uh, wherever the English went to try to interact with and trade with the native peoples there uh, in eastern North Carolina, they brought disease. And before they left or as they were leaving, you know, hundreds of native people began to die, the old, the young, from different diseases that the Europeans had brought. And this became so bad that uh, when the native people saw the English sailing up the various waterways in eastern North Carolina to try to make contact with their villages, they abandoned their villages and they ran away. They did not want to have any contact with the English because they saw them as harbingers of death. And so when we get to the Tuscaroras on the Roanoke River, again, that is their reaction to the English coming into their territory. Not only did they not want them to explore and understand anything about their territory, but they also were very aware of the fact that they had brought disease. Now, this is important, and I'll move quickly. Uh, when we talk about the introduction of the Africans and the fact that the Africans are well armed and the fact that the fa Africans had, were accustomed to living in swamps and in hostile environments because they had done so in the Caribbean, in places like Cuba, places like um, Puerto Rico and Jamaica, as well as Florida. Uh, so the environment in eastern North Carolina was nothing that they were not familiar with, and they certainly knew how to navigate it. And we will see that and see the impact that they have on native peoples, because as I mentioned before, many of the Indians like the Machapungas, the Bear River, the Madame Mesquite, these Indians did not exist in the earliest maps and drawings that were done by John White of eastern North Carolina. They come into existence later in the 1600s and at the time of the Tuscarora War, and many of these uh, native peoples 
basically are black Indians and they, they appear to be a black in appearance. Uh, many of the remnants of those Indians still exist in Hyde County and throughout Eastern North Carolina and Pasquotank and per Perquimans. Some have you know, identified themselves as African-Americans, others still identify themselves as Indian. And you know, they are still, the descendants of these people are still scattered throughout Eastern North Carolina. Next slide, please. This is a drawing of that uh, voyage that we just talked about. If you look to the northeast uh, of your map or the, um, the right top corner of your map, you'll see a, the, a fleet of ships returning from the New World, but that fleet of ship left, went along the coast of Portugal, along the west coast of Africa. If you follow the line coming from England, you see the fleet in the Atlantic Ocean approaching the Lesser Antilles, uh, the Spanish islands in the Lesser Antilles. And then of course you see the route that they took through the Lesser Antilles, attacking Spanish islands, attacking Spanish ships, attacking Florida, Fort St. Augustine, Florida, and then going up the coast of North Carolina and then returning to England. Uh, on this voyage uh, with these African soldiers that they picked up in the Caribbean and promising them their freedom if they would fight for England, uh, the English amassed a fortune. They took gold, they took silver, uh, precious, uh, uh, you know, uh, all types of precious metals and uh, precious stones. And uh, when they arrived back in England, uh, the wealth that they extracted from the Spanish uh, colonies in the Americas was used by the English government to build the British Navy and basically enrich and build the British Empire and their future you know, exploits in the Americas. So it's a story that's not talked about. There's a lot of North Carolina history and a lot of history with Native and African peoples that has been left out and we haven't really discussed. Uh, traditionally, scholars said, well, these people must have died you know, when they arrived in the Americas. But as I've tried to outline for you, based on their background and their immunity to diseases like malaria and smallpox, uh, these Africans obviously survived in Eastern North Carolina. And you can see the impact that they had on the various native peoples in Eastern North Carolina. Next slide, please. It's also important to understand that in this group of Africans that there was a mix of people. There were uh, some Jews, there were some Muslims, there were some Moors, Moors are North Africans, uh, and there were West Africans. So there were numbers of different peoples, including Native, uh, Native Americans from the Caribbean, from places like Puerto Rico and Cuba, all of whom were trying to escape the oppression of the Spanish in the Spanish colonies and who were very willing to join the English and assist the English in their assaults on the Spanish in North America. A lot of people forget that the Muslims and the Moors occupied Portugal and Spain for centuries before they were able to unite themselves under Catholicism and expel them. And they were able to do that with the assistance of Moors. And I always point back to uh, Shakespeare's and the opera Othello and the play in the opera about um, the African general who helped the Spanish in their campaigns. So the Spaniards are quite familiar with Africans and the English didn't have quite as much familiarity, but they did become familiar with them, but they were seen as soldiers and they were basically used by the Spanish and then later by the English to get a foothold in North America. Next slide, please. So it's important for North Carolinians to understand that when we look at our history and we talk about the history of African-Americans and Indian African people in Eastern North Carolina and in North Carolina, that our history predates the history of enslaved people in Virginia who arrive in 1619 by at least 33 years. And this is just for North Carolina, but if you go further south to South Carolina and to Florida, uh, you'll find that, of course, Africans were introduced by the Spaniards even before that. Fort St. Augustine's, which is today Jacksonville, Florida, was an all African garrison. It was basically manned by all African soldiers. And it was their goal, uh, their role to pacify the Indians in Florida and along the road that's called Zacateca, which was to go across towards Texas. So there had been an African presence in Florida, in South Carolina, in Georgia, under the Spanish and with the Spanish from the very beginning, from exploration, going back to the times in which Africans were used as soldiers and generals in the Spanish and Portuguese armies to expel the Moors and the Muslims from Portugal and Spain. 
And so in North Carolina, it's important to understand that the English just basically took a play out of that playbook and they employed these Africans to help them get a foothold in North America as well. Next slide, please. So when we talk about African triracials and African Indian white people, um, again, we see native peoples, the Algonquin speaking peoples of Eastern North Carolina absorbing Africans and Europeans and other Indians. And we see the Tuscarora doing the same thing. As Indians get displaced by European expansion and settlement, as Native Americans are, are impacted by disease, and we see how disease is ravaging our world and our country and changing our lives today. And as I've said, um, oftentimes imagine what would happen if you did not have, uh, we didn't have this technology, if we could not uh, Zoom. I mean, uh, imagine what would have happened to our population and the decline in the population based on this outbreak of disease. So the same thing happens to native people. And in native people, women as well as men, uh, they, are, they, they need a community to survive. It is a landscape that has still wild animals. It still has, you know, farming that needs to be done, the building of structures. And so many Native people readily accepted into their community and adopted um, people, whether they were Afri of African descent or European descent, who were willing to be a part of the community and to put the community first and help these communities to survive what was already a, 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 a hard existence, but made harder by the invasion of Europeans and the impact that the English and other Europeans were having on native peoples and uh, native societies. Next slide, please. So we have creolization. Certainly we have some whites who have no mixtures. We have some Africans that have very little or no mixture. And we have some native peoples who may have little or no mixture. But there are many people who are either part white and part Indian, part black and part Indian, uh, part Indian and uh, part native, uh, I'm sorry, native Indian and African, native and African, but there are mixes of all three. And after centuries, we're talking centuries, I mean, this is all happening over 400 years ago. After centuries of intermixing, it may be if you do your DNA test, you see less Native American blood, but it's important to understand that Native Americans were foundational to the beginnings of the colonies and many Africans and European peoples, you know, have a, a mixture of one or more of those elements. It's also important though, that there is a significant, particularly here in Eastern North Carolina and Southeastern uh, Virginia, a significant triracial population of people who are both Indian, black and white. And they may identify themselves as Indian. They may identify themselves as African-American or they may identify themselves as white but they understand that they have this mixed heritage. Uh, take one group, for example, the Melungeons, who really have roots in Eastern North Carolina, have all these elements, uh, Muslim, Jews, West African, uh, you know, um, background, and they moved into the mountains. Their home place is Gardy, uh, Tennessee. And they basically will basically, in that region, they will live and, um, you know, intermarry and create a community in the mountains of North Carolina and Tennessee and Virginia, West Virginia, Eastern Kentucky, uh, understanding that they are not like the rest of the peoples of that region and oftentimes are um, you know, persecuted by their white neighbors because of their obvious mixture. Um, but they now today, many of the Melungeons embrace that mixture, that triracial heritage, and many of them are beginning to trace their ancestry, which traces back to Eastern North Carolina and Southeastern Virginia, where we know that this was the beginnings of some of these mixed peoples. Uh, next slide, please. So there are a series of questions. Again, I, I, I will you know, post them. I won't go through the entire question. But the bottom line is, you know, when we talk about these early settlements, you know, how did uh, Black and Indigenous people collaborate and build communities um, both separately and together? And the answer to that question is certainly they did do that, but it's important to remember that there were at least four distinct types of communities that involved Indians, Blacks, and Whites uh, in what become triracial communities. There were the settlements themselves. Native people were enslaved and put on plantations with Africans. 
and you also bring in white indentured servants. So Indians, blacks, and whites on plantations in Southeast Virginia and in Eastern North Carolina intermix and intermarry with one another. Then we see in the swamps, particularly the Great Dismal Swamp, uh, but also the Alligator Swamp, we have maroon societies. These Africans that are dropped off in Eastern North Carolina, they make alliances and intermarry with Indian people, Indian women who are in Eastern North Carolina and places like Hyde County. And they end up being independent people and still seeing themselves as native people. And they exist and live throughout Eastern North Carolina and in the swamps of Eastern North Carolina. Uh, then you have frontier settlements. Uh, in the 1600s, Virginia, originally when Virginia was founded, uh, there were indentured servants. There were Indian, black, and white indentured servants. There was no real distinction being made between any of these groups of people. When you finished your servitude after five to seven years, you could basically be free. And you could go and, uh, after your servitude, purchase land and begin to grow tobacco and you know try to make a life for yourself uh, just like the other white planters. Eventually, Virginia began to change the law and they evolved into what we call race-based slavery. And they began to leg uh, legislate that whites and blacks could not marry, that whites, blacks, and Indians could not you know, uh, marry and own property in Virginia even though there were many peoples who had already intermixed. So we had already tri-racial and biracial people who were Indian and black, white and black, Indian, white and black. And they were basically forced out of Virginia because they would have had to become slaves because they began to move to race-based slavery. And if you had any African ancestry, you were gonna be considered a slave. Many of these people will move to the frontier so when we talk about the frontier settlements and we talk about mixed race people on the frontier settlement, uh, some of the first people to settle the frontier and really negotiate and trade with other independent Indian nations on the frontier, like the Tuscarora, were um, mixed race people because they found it easier and better to live with native people uh, than uh, to live in the white settlements where the whites were trying to force them into slavery and servitude. And then finally, native nations, and then we talked about the Maharans, we talked about the Nottaways, we talked about uh, the Tuscarora, as well as the Bear River and the Machapungas and the Madame Mesquite. Uh, most of these independent Indian nations, uh, they adopted runaway slaves, Africans, as well as poor whites who were indentured servants who did run away as well. And so they adopted these people into their nations and they intermarried with their nations. And as I mentioned to you before, uh, the Tuscarora claimed responsibility for destroying the lost colony and taking the white settlers that were there. And they uh, routinely, they and their kinsmen, the Six Nations, uh, harbored runaway slaves and intermarried and intermixed with them. So many native nations um, in the Eastern US on the frontier or border uh, with white settlements uh, had mixed race people and were mixed race. Not all of the Indians in the nation were, but a number of them, a significant number of them were of mixed race because at that time, native people did not, and still I think for the majority today, it wasn't about race, it's about you know kinship. And most of them were matriarchal. If your mother was a native American, if your mother was a Tuscarora, then the child is a Tuscarora. Whether the father was white, whether the father was black, whether the father was Cherokee, if the mother is a Tuscarora, the child is a Tuscarora. And most of the nations in the Eastern United States, that was how they um, developed their communities and their societies. So they were based on the, the bloodline of the mother. And they basically, the children followed the bloodline of their mother. So in that sense, you could have a, a native woman who might have a child who was dark skinned, uh, who looked like an African or have a child that was light skinned with blonde hair and blue eyes and looked like a white person, but the mother was Indian. So we see a, a lot of that happening uh, with many of the native peoples in Eastern North Carolina during this period. Okay, Dr. Smallwood, I know we have at least one question. So at this point, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. All right, uh, this is a team from Elizabeth City State University. How transformative do you believe including this information in, into formal education will be, or could it be? Well, I'm a, a person who believes that education matters, 
and the better educated people are, the better decisions that they make. And I would say coming from Eastern North Carolina and sharing a heritage that, you know, is what I'm trying to, you know, teach people. I think that for everyone understanding this history and understanding how uh, we are all connected uh, is beneficial. And I certainly like would like to think that many of the people who reside in that region in Eastern North Carolina, um, understanding like their 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 food ways, their cultural ways, the things that we do in Eastern North Carolina, how heavily influenced they are by our native ancestors and by the native people, even the foods that we eat, corn, beans, and squash, with the, the, the Tuscarora and Iroquois called the Three Sisters, those things did not exist in Europe prior to contact with, um, uh, North, with, with Europeans and Africans. They were introduced to Europeans and Africans uh, by the Native Americans. So um, there's just so much, you know, that I think we can all learn from understanding how um, interconnected our lives are and were during this particular uh, era and how of course, over time people forget and they move apart and move away, but how much we had in common. We have another question. And this is from Dr. Chris O'Reardon Aja from Wake Tech Engineering. Uh, great presentation and information. Is it possible to get these PowerPoints? Thanks. And I can answer that too. Yes, they're going to be housed with um, the Michael Your Show, and you can email me, Chris, and I'll send you all of the slides. And also, you can get them directly from Dr. Smallwood. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? If not, I'm, I'm going to just announce. Normally, we try to keep this. Oh, another one <laughs> from mm -hmm. Elizabeth City. They, Thank you for answering my question. My alma mater, ECSU, is in Pasquotank County. Great presentation. Thank you, Akeem. And um, Akeem used to teach uh, a, a class at Wake Tech as well. So that's how I met him. And we took some students on the trip down there before the pandemic. And we're going to take some students to A&T when the pandemic is over, otherwise virtual. And I know a lot of you have to leave at 1230, but we're going to continue and we're going to do this just like we're in class and we can go all the way up until five minutes to one. So now, Dr. Smallwood, you can continue. Okay. All right. So next slide, please. So this is just illustrating uh, some of what I was talking about. So we've talked about Eastern North Carolina. We've talked about exploration. We've talked about the English making efforts to try to plant a colony at Roanoke. We all know that that colony failed. I, uh, many of you didn't know about the fact that there were Africans left there as well. But what this map illustrates is as Virginia, and then of course, when the English come back in 1607, they attempt to set up a settlement in Jamestown, which is successful. And from Jamestown, they begin to expand, uh, you know, north, west, and south uh, back into North Carolina, where they had failed to really get a foothold um, uh, quite a few years earlier. This map illustrates after the passage of the laws to change, um, you know, who could be considered a slave or who could be put into indentured servitude. Uh, to Africans and making Africans basically slaves for the rest of their natural lives. Many of these mixed race people, and they were already biracial and triracial, Indian and black, Indian, black and white, uh, flee Virginia and move down into Eastern North Carolina, uh, particularly in uh, Bertie County, where a lot of the earliest settlers of Bertie County were mixed race people who settled in Bertie County with the Tuscarora Indians. That region down there was uh, controlled by the Tuscarora. There were Maharans to their north, as you see on this map, to the west. There were Maharans, and of course, there were Nottaways um, in Virginia, just on the uh, border uh, with the settlements. So, and again, the Nottaways, the Maharans, and the Tuscaroras are all Iroquois. They're all in military alliance. Many of the native peoples to the east, the Powhatans, were being fractured and being enslaved by the English as they expanded in Virginia. And they were coming down into northeastern North Carolina, had already had a devastating impact on native people in eastern North Carolina. And many of these people were coming into military alliance with the Tuscaroras because of the fact that they were the strongest native group there on the border with, on the frontier with the English who were coming in. So this map illustrates uh, the English campaigns in Eastern North Carolina and the routes that they took to move into Pasquotank, Perquimans, uh, Chowan, uh, Coratuck counties, and then over into the Bertie Precinct and what became Bertie County. Uh, next slide, please. So these settlements continue to grow. Uh, 
And as these maps are illustrating, as these settlements grow, you do have the Great Dismal Swamp, which can't be farmed and is very problematic for whites. And lots of Native Americans and Africans move into the Great Dismal Swamp and they intermarry. And there are also runaway white indentured servants or whites who just don't want to be under um, Virginia rule who move into the Great Dismal Swamp as well. And then you see down in the southeast with the Alligator Swamp, it's the same thing. And you need to remember, so if you're studying early colonial documents, that the Virginians considered northeastern North Carolina to be Virginia. They called it Old Virginia. So eastern North Carolina, all this area that you see shaded in gray, all of this is considered Virginia. And, um, and so Virginia pretty much policed the area, but they continued to expand west and try to uh, acquire, uh, you know, good tobacco land. Uh, in the coastal plains and in the Piedmont, and they just didn't have the energy to try to track these uh, maroon communities uh, in the Great Dismal Swamp, which I've already uh, explained, were uh, basically independent, sovereign, Indian, Indian, African mixed nations in the Great Dismal Swamp and the Alligator Swamp of eastern North Carolina. What they did is just went around it. They tried to avoid those people, but those people existed as independent sovereign people in those areas. And it became you know, somewhat problematic uh, for them um, until they began to drain the swamps to try to get those people out. Uh, next slide, please. So we see large numbers of white indentured servants. We see large numbers of English settlers beginning to move into the British um, colonies. Uh, in the Caribbean, as well as in Virginia and North Carolina, and even in the Northeast in places like Massachusetts. Next slide, please. And because of the importance of tobacco and the expansion of tobacco plantations throughout Virginia and Northeastern North Carolina, the need and the demand for labor became very intense, and they will begin the process of importing large numbers of Africans as well. And so we see, you know, eventually, uh, tens, you know, hundreds, thousands of Africans being brought into North Carolina and Virginia uh, and into the 13 colonies, as well as the British Caribbean. Next slide, please. So we see the development of colonies, of English influence, you know, the English colonies in Virginia, North Carolina, Maryland, and even in New England with Massachusetts, as well as uh, places like Rhode Island and Connecticut. But there were other European nations, the Dutch along the Hudson River Valley, uh, the French along the St. Lawrence River Valley, um, and even, um, you know, the Swedes. So we have other Europeans who are attempting to settle. But in all of these areas, there are Africans being introduced as slaves in all of these areas. And these Africans are running away. And these native people are taking these Africans in and they are intermixing and intermarrying with them. And they are opposed, you know, in the Northeast, the Northeastern Indians uh, stand opposed to slavery. Now, why this is the case, I'm not completely sure, but the Six Nations, uh, the Mohawks, the Oneidas, the Onondagas, the Cayugas, and the Tuscaroras, along with the Meharans and Nottaways, who are their brothers and kinsmen, uh, tended to stand against African and Indian slavery and they tended to oppose the expansion of slavery into their territories. And you can see their, the locations of their territories on this map and also the Indians that are aligned with them, which would include the Delaware Indians, the Nanticoke Indians, and even uh, those uh, members of the Powhatan Confederacy who have not already been enslaved or uh, you know, destroyed by the English in the Chesapeake uh, uh, River Valley or the Chesapeake Bay region. Next slide, please. So again, we'll talk a little bit about um, the slave trade, the Native American slave trade and the African slave trade. And I should be able to touch on the Tuscarora War. Next slide, please. Many people know about the African slave trade. Fewer people know about the Native American slave trade. There were millions of Native Americans, beginning with the Spanish in the Caribbean, uh, who were shipped out of the British Caribbean. We talked about this in the last presentation, back to Spain and Portugal, and many of the women were sold as sex slaves and concubines to the various uh, families in Europe. The same thing happened in North America. Uh, people tend to not understand that there was a brisk Native American slave trade, and that yes, other Native Americans uh, assisted the English in enslaving Native Americans. And so we see that the uh, Tuscaroras were caught up in this trade. Uh, 
Native people were not unlike Europeans or like African peoples. They had long-standing disagreements and conflicts with one another. The Catawbas, the Cherokees, the Creeks, um, the Yamasees, um, they did not get along with the Tuscaroras and their allies, you know, the Six Nations or uh, the other Indian groups that were aligned with them, like the Saponis and the Tutelos uh, and the Choanooks. And so then when the English offered guns and gunpowder and munitions to Native Americans, if they would assist them in destroying Native nations uh, or enslaving those nations, there were nations uh, that did involve themselves in that uh, slave trade. So like Africans being involved in the African slave trade and then selling those Africans to Europeans, there were Indians who were involved in the native slave trade and they used the weapons that the English gave them to defeat and destroy their enemies. And those Indians were sold off into slavery. Uh, one of the largest, uh, biggest causes of the Tuscarora War was the kidnapping and enslavement of Tuscarora women and children, which was occurring by white settlers who were moving into Eastern North Carolina and um, by uh, other groups of people. This uh, set off the Tuscarora War, which became the bloodiest and most destructive war in colonial North Carolina history. But there were tens of thousands of Indians, millions of Indians that were um, kidnapped and sold into slavery and shipped to the British Caribbean. While I have this illustration up, I will mention just very briefly. Uh, generally speaking, uh, the men and boys were sometimes shipped to places like Massachusetts and to New York uh, and Philadelphia. But what they didn't realize is that the Tuscaroras in particular were allies with the Six Nations. So as soon as these Indian males got north, they ran away to the Six Nations. And as I said, the Six Nation never returned slaves. And in fact, it was almost uh, inciting a major continental war with the enslavement of Tuscaroras. So they began to ship the Tuscarora men uh, and boys uh, over a certain age to the Caribbean, to Jamaica, St. Kitts, Nevis, and they would be seasoned there. They could not run away. They could not get back. They knew the landscape in North America better than the English did, so they couldn't escape and get back to their people, so they sent them to the Caribbean. They kept Native American women, and they shipped African men who had been seasoned in the British Caribbean to the mainland, and they intermarried them or bred African men with native women. And of course, the native men that were sent to the British Caribbean, they paired them with African women in the Caribbean. So there was a process and this trade did exist. North Carolina was a part of the trade, uh, one of the causes for the Tuscarora War. And even at the end of the Tuscarora War, over a third of the people are gonna be slaughtered in the war. A third of the people are going to be enslaved and shipped to various plantations in Virginia, North Carolina, and the British Caribbean, and they're going to be made into slaves, and they're going to be mixed with African people. This is a forced mixing, uh, biracial, triracial mixing, and we've talked about all the different ways in which uh, Native people are mixed with Africans. Next slide, please. Again, just illustrating that slave trade and the European nations that were engaged in it. Next slide, please. And then again, um, getting to the question of how slavery um, affected both communities, that's both African communities and Native American communities. And as I've illustrated again, um, as people are introduced and the need for labor uh, and the uh, legal expansion of slavery, both Native Americans as well as Africans are caught up in what we call the Native American slave trade, and they are being basically uh, used as slave labor to clear land and to cultivate um, cash crops, particularly in North Carolina tobacco. Okay. And again, and it has to be touched on, it does split Native American nations in bet uh, between slaving nations and non-slaving nations. And we look at the divide today between the North and the South, and that divide basically Virginia, North Carolina. Um, I talked about in the first part of this presentation, uh, the Northeastern woodlands and the Southeastern woodlands. Uh, the Northeastern woodlands pretty much runs down to the Cape Fear River, and it includes the Tuscaroras and the Agonquins that were on the coast, the Muchapungas, Matamuskeet, Bear River, et cetera. Um, and it goes from there along the Cape Fear River northward. So the Indians south of the Cape Fear River and it, it, its source is here 
in uh, the triad air region in the Winston-Salem, Greensboro region, uh, those native nations south of that river, uh, they uh, like the Catawbas, the Yamases, uh, the Cherokees, they became involved with the slave with slaving, with actually taking native peoples and, and selling them as slaves. And as a result of that, um, unfortunately, there became conflicts between the northeastern Indians, the Tuscaroras and their allies, and the southeastern Indians, which led to wars between the two uh, groups of people. So uh, slavery had a very negative impact on native people in North Carolina in terms of dividing native people, and they had already had uh, disagreements or conflicts before, but the slave trade um, really only um, intensified uh, these uh, differences between uh, native nations that were um, present in uh, North Carolina. Uh, next slide, please. This is just the, I won't go through all of these dates, but it's the evolution of, of the laws pertaining to African people in uh, Virginia and North Carolina. And remember, uh, Northeastern North Carolina was considered part of Virginia until they separate uh, and create North Carolina as a separate colony. And so the laws that were being passed in Virginia would have impacted um, the peoples in uh, the native and African peoples, all peoples in North Carolina, as well as Virginia. I point you to, um, I'll go down to start with D in, in 1662, that the children follow the condition of their mother. And you remember that I mentioned to you that native people were matriarchal and that uh, it didn't matter who the father of the child was, but if the woman was Native American, the child was considered Native American. And if it was considered Native American would have been considered free. So the law is being adjusted here to say that, you know, if a person is enslaved, then the child will follow the condition of the mother and they would be enslaved. Also in 1664, I'm skipping along here, but in 1664, um, we see interracial marriage being um, banned in the colony. And uh, any uh, free woman who marries a slave will serve the slave's master until her husband dies and their children will be enslaved. So we see again that there were inter, uh, um, mixing that was taking place between uh, whites and blacks and whites, blacks and Indians. And we see laws trying to deal with them. I always point out to my students that we don't pass a law until we have a problem, right? We didn't pass seatbelt law until you know people were being killed not wearing the seatbelt, so we made it mandatory. Uh, we didn't pass uh, drunk driving laws. People can't drink and drive until people are starting to be killed, and we said we got to do something about it, so we passed a law. So when you look at this legislation, these laws that are being passed in Virginia, and they're impacting North Carolina because North Carolina is seen as a part of Virginia, you have to understand that this is something that's, that's happening. You know, how rampant it is, but it's happening and it's problematic to the leaders of Virginia and they wanted to change it. Next slide, please. And then the last of these laws um, uh, that I think are very important uh, is we go to 1664. Um, let's see, Mark's husband, we already did that one. So we go down to 1670 and we talk about Indians being captured uh, elsewhere and sold as slaves to Virginia were to serve for life and those captured in Virginia until the age of 30. The point is that you see that there is a very brisk Native American slave trade uh, taking place in Virginia and in North Carolina in the 1600s. Next slide, please. Um, here, what we want to point to is, um, I'll go down to 1682. And it says all servants who were Negroes, Moors, mulattoes, or Indians were to be considered slaves at the time of their purchase uh, if neither their parents nor country were Christian. Now, you heard me talk about Moors before, right? You heard me talk about Muslims before, right? We've been talking about uh, African-Americans and Indians, right? And so what is a Negro and what is a mulatto? Well, many of the early documents will show mulattoes as being black and Indian. And so we assume mulattoes are people who are black and white. But we'll see if you look at the colonial records and you look at slavery, you'll see that black and Indian are considered Negroes and they're considered uh, mulattoes. And so we're basically classifying mixed people and pulling them away from their traditional way 
of interacting with one another to create a slave society so that you can have uh, an enslaved labor force that will help to uh, enrich the landowners and the, um, the plantation class. Uh, next slide, please. And so I'm gonna stop with these. I won't go into a whole lot more de detail, but you see by 16, um, you know, 1691, uh, you know, Owners were compensated for Negroes, mulattoes, or slaves that were killed resisting. And then in 1691, we also see a law being passed forbidding the miseducation of um, uh, that that abominable that, that abominable mixture uh, between um, you know Africans and whites or Africans and Indians. And then any white um, you know uh, uh, man or woman who marries. Um, a Negro, mulatto, or Indian is to be um, banished. We talked about the people moving from Virginia to Eastern North Carolina to Bertie County, uh, that they're going to be banished. So the point is, what I'm saying is that they're fining people, they're banishing people, but laws are being passed to try to separate uh, these people, but they're mixing them all together and just calling them Negroes or calling them Blacks when in fact they are you know, a mixed heritage. And if they were in Indian communities or Indian societies, they would be considered Indian, okay? So we'll pass through this. Next slide, please. Um, and then again, these last ones I point out just because, uh, again, talking about mulatto again in 1705, um, it's important to remember that North Carolina doesn't legalize slavery until 1715, which is uh, two years after the end of the Tuscarora War. And one of the reasons why they are doing this is because they have now captured all of these Indians, Tuscaroras, Matamuskeet, Bear River, all these different Indians who had aligned themselves against them in the war, and they've made them slaves. And then we go up to 1705, and it says the mulatto is defined as the child of an Indian, the grandchild or great-grandchild of a Negro, right? So we know that Indians and blacks have intermixed and been intermixing for a very long time, probably as free people, most likely as free people in the swamps. And then they're being captured and they're being sold into slavery on plantations in Virginia and North Carolina. And so the law is adjusting to that, to deal with these Africans, these mulattoes and Indians, you know, and they're gonna be pro prohibited from holding office, uh, prohibited from owning land, and laws are going to stop them from being intermarried with what is considered, you know, pure whites or whites who are not of any mixed ancestry. OK, next slide, please. And so now we're coming into the Tuscarora War and we're going to wind down this presentation if I have time. So, uh, you know, uh, Michael, you have to let me know, Mr. Ure, let me know when, when it closes out. But we'll wind it down real quick. Uh, as I mentioned, the Tuscarora War was as much about slavery and about the kidnapping and enslaving of Tuscarora women and children and the allies of the Tuscarora, the Algonquin peoples in Eastern North Carolina uh, uh, as anything else. And that is what will set off that war. Next slide, please. And so we see the Tuscarora sitting in Eastern North Carolina. I talked about the Cape Fear River being the dividing line between the Northeastern Indians and Southeastern Indians. And so not just the Tuscaroras, but their allies, the Hatteras, the Cape Fear Indians, you know, that are in Eastern North Carolina. These Indians all tend to be opposed to the institution of slavery because so many of their women and children have been enslaved and mixed with Africans. And so they are gonna engage in a great war, a great military campaign against the whites to end their uh, expansion and their colonization of their homeland and to basically push them out. Uh, you see to the southeast, those Indians south of the Cape Fear River, the Catawbas, the Yamasee, uh, the Cherokees, the Creek, the Chickasaws, Choctaws, what we eventually call the five civilized tribes, they were all actually um, slaving Indians. They all actually owned slaves and forced march slaves out to Oklahoma when they moved to Oklahoma after Indian removal. But they are involved in the Native American slave trade and later in the capturing of runaway Africans throughout the 16 and 1700s. In fact, the Timica Indians that you see down here in Florida and the Appalachians were completely decimated by the Cherokees and sold off into slavery uh, to Charleston, South Carolina and shipped to the British Caribbean. Um, so slavery had a very negative impact, not just on North Carolina and Virginia, but on the, the deep South as well. And we still see that lingering and lasting effects of, of, this, uh, of this institution uh, 
on just not just African people, but native peoples as well. Next slide, please. So the, this map shows the villages, the Tuscarora villages in Eastern North Carolina, just at the start of the Tuscarora War and the roads leading into the, uh, to the Southeast uh, to where the Southeastern Indians are. Uh, next slide, please. And again, uh, these are the Native Americans that were in alliance with one another against the, um, the colony of North Carolina during the Tuscarora War. So there were Seneca Indians who had come down from, um, um, uh, from uh, the New York State. Uh, they were Iroquois Indians who uh, were supportive, not just the Senecas, all of the Six Nations, but the Senecas, one of the largest groups. Uh, the Monacans, who Jefferson said were Tuscaroras, but they were a mix of, yes, Tuscarora and Siouan people, but the Monacans of the Piedmont of Virginia, not a ways who I've already said were, um, you know, basically Iroquois and, and kinsmen or a branch of the Tuscaroras, the Maharans, and then Mingos, who tended to be a mix of Seneca and Tuscarora, who did not fo follow the matriarchal bloodline, uh, they were a part of this alliance as well. And then to the east, you had your Machapunga Indians, your Bear River Indians, your Manta Mesquite Indians, the Core and Noosk Indians, um, all of whom uh, were of mixed ancestry, uh, you know, African Indian, African Indian white ancestry. And they create a confederation that will fight against uh, the white settlers who are trying to expand into their territory and to enslave their people. Uh, next slide, please. This is just a, uh, an advertisement um, that was at a Boston post office, and it illustrates the selling of a Indian boy from Carolina. That's what's highlighted. Again, this is just documentation showing the enslavement of uh, Indian people from the Carolinas and that they were being shipped, not just to the Northeast, but to the Caribbean. Next slide, please. And this is the Tuscarora War Council, um, you know, with uh, their whites there, John White, I'm sorry, um, uh, yeah, John, uh, the, the John Lawson, I'm sorry, John Lawson and, and Baron uh, uh, Christo de Graffenrid, uh, Christopher de Graffenrid, who were held. You see in the center there, two, two white men with their hands bound and the one African with his hands bound. I have to explain this illustration to people because uh, it gives the impression that the Africans were treated the same as the whites. There were actually two Africans that were with um, Lawson and with the Graffenrid when they were captured by the Tuscaroras and put on trial for kidnapping and selling into slavery Native American women and children. Both Africans were immediately freed, allowed to go free. One African joined the Tuscaroras and participated in the war. The other African hid in the forest and then returned to John White um, after he was tried and released I'm sorry, uh, to, to Graffenrid, John Lawson was actually executed by the Tuscaroras for his crimes against the Tuscarora. But Baron de Graffenrid was freed, you know, because, you know, the, the chiefs spoke uh, in his favor and he was freed. The slave that was with de Graffenrid, one of the slaves hid in the forest and then returned to, to de Graffenrid when he was released. De Graffenrid drew the illustration and he drew his fateful slave uh, there beside him because he was loyal to him and returned to him. But the other slave is not represented in the image because he did not return. He joined the Tuscaroras. And the Tuscaroras were known for taking in runaway slaves and adopting them into their nation. And those slaves oftentimes, uh, of course, helped them design fortifications and fought um, with them when they fought against the whites during the war. Uh, next slide, please. These are images of the attacks. Uh, Tuscaroras attacked plantations and settlements, um, and they freed Africans unless the Africans took up arms against them and supported their white slavers. So they, again, you know, during the war, again, they made a distinction between the Africans who were enslaved, who they saw um, in the same condition as their loved ones who had been kidnapped and sold into slavery, but they did not uh, appreciate the whites who had come and taken their people and sold them into slavery. Next slide, please. But it's also important to understand that during the Tuscarora War and the first war uh, and second, there were two wars. Um, the Tuscaroras were united in the first war. And in that first war, pretty much had defeated the whites in North Carolina. It was Native Americans, um, Cherokees, Creeks, 
uh, Choc uh, Chickasaw, uh, not Chickasaws, but uh, Catawbas and Yamasees, who uh, aligned themselves with the whites and created an overwhelming force that defeated the Tuscaroras at Fort Neoroca and basically ended up um, destroying the Tuscaroras, killing a third of them, enslaving a third of them, and then the rest became refugees um, and either fled North Carolina or dispersed into the swamps throughout Eastern North Carolina. There are, there are numerous uh, descendants of the Tuscaroras in Eastern North Carolina today, you know, in Robeson County and in other various counties between Robeson County and Bertie County, but numerous uh, descendants of Tuscaroras and the other Indian groups, the Matamuskeet and Machapungas, who fled into the swamps and remain, you know, in North Carolina and refused to leave. Um, Neoroka is, uh, there was uh, a memorial put there a couple of years ago. It is still considered one of the largest mass burials of native people. Over 900, close to 900 people were killed and burned alive in the fort during the final siege at Fort Neoroka. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's still in Snow Hill, North Carolina today. And a memorial to those people who were killed in that battle was put up a couple of years ago, which I thought was a, a wonderful thing to talk about, um, you know, what had happened in terms of the sacrifice that Tuscarora people had experienced there during the Tuscarora War uh, and the impact that it had on the Tuscarora people in North Carolina. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, and again, you have to close me down because I, I mean, we, we're wrapping it up. The war ends. Um, these are the nations here, the Cherokees, the Creeks, the Yamases, the Catawbas, and then white slavers who basically destroy the Tuscaroras in Eastern North Carolina and enslave them. And it leads to what we call the Tuscarora diaspora, because even though there were many Tuscaroras that stayed in North Carolina as refugees in their homeland, fleeing persecution um, and violence, uh, others uh, left North Carolina and settled in a host of places. Next slide, please. Um, it's important to understand that following the Tuscarora War and the acquiring of Tuscarora and their allies' land in eastern North Carolina, in a skirmish after the war in 1715, um, in which a white was wounded, he wasn't killed, he was wounded by Tuscaroras, the state of North Carolina issued a general order that called for the complete destruction of the Tuscarora nation as if there had never been a peace made with them. That uh, order led to the systematic uh, slaughter of, of the remaining free Tuscaroras throughout eastern North Carolina. Um, a lot of people in eastern North Carolina, if you talk to them, they're of African American, Native American, or um, mixed European ancestry, they'll say that they're Cherokee. Now, Cherokees were never in this part of eastern North Carolina other than during the Tuscarora War. Cherokees' lands begin in Tennessee, in the mountains of Tennessee and North Carolina. Uh, but the Cherokees were no great heroes to um, North Carolina for their role in the destruction of the Tuscarora during the Tuscarora War. So I believe, as and this is a, an assumption, you know, that as a defensive mechanism or a way to preserve their existence, many um, remnant peoples who were Tuscarora or other began to say that they were Cherokee to basically um, preserve their existence in eastern North Carolina. Because Tuscaroras, if they knew you were a Tuscarora, you would either be killed or you would be enslaved. Your women and children would be taken and enslaved. And so many of the, the Tuscaroras who were left in eastern North Carolina after the war who did not migrate out uh, just kind of went undercover and just blended into the white and the general um, black population in eastern North Carolina. All right. All right I'm going to interrupt now, okay. although I think it was very, very, very interesting. Uh, we have some comments, but I also want to say anybody who wants these slides, please email me and I'll get them to you. Dr. Smallwood has given us that great privilege and thank you for your willingness to share. So any um, teachers that want to share this with your students or expand on this conversation or maybe even ask Dr. Smallwood to do a sub because all of these things that we talked about today were really like a whole semester, you know, today and the last time and we did all that. You did a great job of maintaining, you know, your trend. I, I can tell you're a Rhodes Scholar for real. <laughs> and I know that means you travel throughout North Carolina doing presentations and virtually. I thank you for uh, sharing your expertise with Wake Tech students, faculty, staff, and the community. Wow. The first, again, is from Chris Aridan Aja. Thanks for sharing about the Native American slave trade. I always wondered about that. This is great. Would definitely like to learn about it. Thanks, Chris. 
and Zach Oxendine. I know some oxen dies, but that's great information. They're from uh, down in, uh, is it Roberson? Not Roberson County, but um, Pembroke area. Chris, again, this is just great. Chris, you just liked a lot, didn't you? <laughs> I just watched a five-part series on slavery by Dr. Henry Louis Gates on the front line, which started in the 1500s. But he went through the timeless, through the timeline very quickly, but this is great. And uh, and Christy Shields, again, our uh, student activities director, and you got to meet her backstage earlier. Great information. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise. Tanya Beatty, that's interesting about the Cherokee label. I didn't think of that. And Akeem, again, do you know any ancestry research that can distinguish the Indian ancestry? So this is a question for you. And, and yes. Um, if, if you reach out to me by email, I can give you some links, but there are several, especially with DNA today, there are several projects that really go through um, people's connections to various native groups. Um, and I can give you the links to those and, uh, and they actually use DNA as well to try to match families and match people. So yes, there, you, there, are, there are old sources that talk about family names because there are certain family names as uh, you know, uh, Michael just noted the Oxidines, uh, just like Locklears down in Robeson County, you got Locklears, Oxidines, Lowry's. I mean, very, I mean, there are a couple of families that are very, very prolific, very you know, prominent, well-known families uh, that are connected. So uh, yes, there are lists of, um, of of native families and native peoples, and then people have been using DNA to to match those people as well. And even with some of the mixed race people, you know, I think Tanya Beatty, uh, we we I've talked to some folks. They're part Saponi, part Lumbee, and part Tuscarora. And then you know they have these mixes, and you have clumps of family names with the Melungeons, and they overlap. Uh, whether we're talking about Gibsons, or we talk, because you even see there's a reservation in Canada that's a Tuscarora, uh, a, a Six Nation reservation that's called Gibson. It has a, a native name as well, but it was called Gibson for a long time. And then we had Gibsons all over. You'll find Gibsons uh, with the Melungeon, uh, Melungeon name as well as with some Indian families. But there are some families that overlap and then some that don't. It's all a matter of where they settled and who they intermarried with, and you'll have you know consistency with certain family names. Okay. Laura Bethay from our Office of Career and Employment Resources. Wow, this is a wealth of information. I'm intrigued to learn more. Thanks for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us today. And Laura also works on our equity, equity and diversity um, projects at Wake Tech, which I think she does an excellent job with that, making sure that we have equitable outcomes for all of our students. Um, Finally, I'm going to let you have the closing word, and I'm going to say this is the Michael Ewer Show version of the Martin Luther King holiday celebration. And I know people like to do breakfasts and sing Kumbaya, but I think this kind of information is very relevant to what Martin Luther King stood for. And I hope that we will celebrate it virtually. And I will also say the North Carolina Museum of History will be hosting the statewide kickoff for Black History Month for North Carolina on January the 30th, the last Saturday. And you can go to the museum's website and get that information and you can sign up for different workshops and jazz performances and dance performances and authors and wonderful history. And there is something coming up about the Native, a Native American, African-American, um, European mixture at the museum. And I'll send that to you, Dr. Smallwood, and I'll have that um, at the next show. So I'm gonna step back and say, you, you got a lot and I know it's a lot, <laughs> but if you want those slides, just email me and Dr. Smallwood, you just need to give out your contact information. And Sarah, could you just put that? And Sarah's been in the background doing so much. Thank you so much. Y'all can directly email him or call him. You may want him to come to your school, to your class or your organization. So, but I'm gonna let you close it out. It's been great. And, and thank you again for coming. Well, again, I want to thank you for the invitations, for both invitations and the audience. I want to thank you all for, for taking the time to, to hear this presentation. And yes, I'm always available and, and, and willing and interested in working with community groups and with uh, students. And to the comment earlier, yes, I'm just a believer in education and having deep, deep roots in Eastern North Carolina. I know that there's just a lot that I grew up not knowing, and I've learned it through doing this research and traveling around. And I certainly uh, believe that uh, there is value in those of us who have ties to North Carolina, uh, learning this history and, and, and understanding it and being able to share it with our children.
Right. Well, thank you again, audience, and I'll see you in two weeks on the next Michael Your Show at 12 o'clock. It's going to be hard to find somebody to top you, but we're going to try. <laughs> <laughs>